fist bump of a couple people around you. Tell them we the kind of people to come to the 1130 service because we were up 12 hours ago. Bring you to the new year. Most of us have started out years past with resolutions that end at excuses. How many of you have been there before? I told Connie a couple days ago, I said, oh yeah, this is the time of year where we write down all the things that we're not going to do this year. Is that right? That's what we write down. And we get to the end of the year and we've got a lot of excuses, but we didn't accomplish a whole lot of our resolutions. And so this year I thought, what if we, what if we had revelations, in other words, we heard from God, we we're hungry to hear from God, that ended in empowerment for what God wants us to do for this year. So instead of what we think we ought to do, let's hear from God about what he wants us to do, and let's have some New Year's revelations. Anybody game for some New Year's revelations? What is God saying to us, and what are we going to do about it? And so for the next few weeks... I believe that we have some stories from the Bible that are incredible examples to us of people who walked with God and obeyed God and were called by God. And it will allow us to see how to live a lion-hearted life. In fact, every year I pick a word for my year. And this year I picked this word lion-hearted. Lion-hearted means to be brave. It means to be determined. Brave. We're going to be brave and we're going to be determined. We're going to be brave that we can step into 2017 and finally kick those fears in the teeth that you have. Finally kind of go on up against that enemy that's been battling you for all these years. Finally go against those losses that you've had in your life. Finally go against the stuff that you've got to be brave in, that you've got to, got to press into. We're going to actually face the challenges before us. We're going to be brave enough to admit what they are. To face them and say, God, I want to be brave. I want to be brave and do what you've called me to do. We're going to be determined, facing the new year, resolved. Determined that we're going to go forward and ask God, what would you have me to do? What is the revelation that you have for me? What are you saying to me? And what am I going to do about it? Because we're going to be resolved because the Bible tells us, some of you feel like you had a bad year in 2016. But see, when I read the Bible, it tells you if you're a Christ follower, you are the head and not the tail. That's what the Bible tells you. If you're a Christ follower, it says you're the top and not the bottom. And so you may feel like you're down, but that is not a reality that is true. The truth is, is what God speaks. And the truth is, is that God says you can be determined, you can be brave because I have plans for you. You. I have things I want to accomplish in you. I have things I want to do through you. And it's going to be an amazing year because God is an amazing God. How many are with me on that this morning? That God wants to do something in us. He wants to do more. In fact, I want to make sure you're still awake with me. Somebody shout brave. brave. We'll be brave. Somebody shout determined. Brave. Somebody shout I will be lion hearted. Say lion hearted. This is the part where I feel like I should go, freedom! You guys will charge and we'll tackle 2017. We're going to be brave. We're going to be determined. We're going to be lion-hearted. We're starting this weekend looking at Judges chapter 6. The story of Gideon, brave, lion-hearted, determined Gideon that we saw lead the people of Israel against the Midianites. But how did he get there? How did it all happen and what can we learn from it, Judges chapter 6, it says in chapter, verse 11, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Oprah. Before she had her TV show or her network, she's had a good tree, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer, Gideon, son of Joash, was, listen to this, threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. In the Bible, the Bible teaches us oftentimes through tensions. And we'll read the Bible and there's always these tensions that are there. and They're trying to be settled and sometimes they're not a tension to be resolved, but it's a tension to be managed and, and we learn from the tensions. And in this scripture, there's a tension there. And the tension is, is what was Gideon doing? Gideon, the son of Joash, he was threshing wheat. But where was he threshing wheat? At the bottom of a wine press. 
Now, I don't know a lot about wheat and wine, but I know that wheat doesn't have a whole lot to do with wine. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. You don't make wine out of wheat. They don't go together, so there's a tension here. I want to find out what is the tension for. Why are you threshing wheat in a wine press, Gideon? Well, what we know about Gideon is that he's hiding the grain from the Midianites. I think he's hiding more than the grain from the Midianites. But he's down there trying to do something, threshing wheat, in a place that it wasn't meant to be done in. Because here's the thing I know about threshing wheat. The reason you thresh wheat, you have the threshing fork, is that you take the wheat and you throw it up into the air, and then the heaviest comes down, and that's the good stuff, and then the stuff that's not meant to be there anymore blows away in the wind. That's how you thresh the wheat. You separate it out, but you throw it up in the air, the wind blows the chaff away, the, the heavy wheat comes down, and you just keep doing that until you have all the good stuff left. And here's what I know about a wine press. There's no wind in the bottom of a wine press. And so Gideon is down there accomplishing, he thinks, something, a purpose with this wheat. He's down there threshing the wheat. But what we know about a wine press is that his purpose is not going to be accomplished. He's just going to be, everything's going to be falling back down. He's just going through the motions. And see, I think sometimes we just go through the motions in life. There's different reasons why we do it. I think one of the reasons why Gideon probably did this is the same reason that you and I do things and we make choices that we make. Is sometimes we just don't know what to do, so we just do the opposite. If I'm up on top, Gideon thought, where the Midianites can see me, they may come and steal the wheat and they may come and hurt me. So I will go down below into the wine press and I will thresh the wheat there. The problem is, is that the threat, wheat wasn't going to be threshed there. And sometimes we do that. We do the opposite of whatever we think is the wrong thing. So if the wrong thing is to be up here, I'll go down here. But we do the same thing in our life, just the opposite. So we think that the opposite of the wrong way would be the right way. So we go over here and we make another choice. But we find that the opposite of the wrong way isn't always the right way. Sometimes it's just another wrong way. Maybe you found this in your life. Maybe you were in your marriage and you felt like, you know what, marriage is not fulfilling me. I'm not getting my needs met. I, I'm not happy with my marriage. And so the opposite of marriage is to be single and divorced. And so you said, well, I'll just do the opposite. And so I'll go, I'll make the decision that is the opposite of what seemed to be the wrong choice in my life. And I'll be single. But then you get over here and you're lonely. You see, well, now I'm lonely. I'm not fulfilled. I need somebody to spend my life with. I need somebody to meet my needs. And so the opposite of what seems to be the wrong thing would be to get married again. And so you move over here and you find another spouse and you get married again. And then you get over here and you go, I'm still not fulfilled. It wasn't the right choice just being the opposite choice. It seems like maybe there was something that I needed to do that I wasn't doing because I'm not accomplishing my purpose. I'm down in the wine cellar but I'm throwing up wheat but nothing's being separated. See, what we find about ourselves is oftentimes uh, what we find is that we get new spouses and new jobs and new cars and new houses, but we still have the same you, right? You keep taking you to all those different houses and all these different cars and all these different relationships, but you're still there. And until you allow God to separate in you the things that need to be away and the good stuff that needs to fall down, which you got to do up here, not down here. You got to get a new altitude, which gives you a new attitude. You got to see from a new perspective that you're down here and you're just doing another wrong thing. We get that way with church. For some of you who come to church, you, you feel something. Go to a small group. You begin to have relationships in your life that are speaking into your life. But then all of a sudden you don't feel it. Your emotions and your feelings begin to take over. You don't feel it anymore. You go to a small group and you just don't feel it anymore. You don't like the things that you're feeling. And so you go with the opposite of that is just to disengage. I'll stop going to church or I'll stop going to my small group and you just disengage. But then you find yourself and life gets even harder. See, the opposite of not feeling is not to go out and try to find a new feeling. The opposite of not feeling is to have a little bit of faith. It's somewhere there in the middle. It's different. It's not the opposite. And Gideon, I think one of the reasons why he was down in the wine cellar is he just thought, I'll just do the opposite of what seems to be the bad idea. And so he finds himself in a low place. You've found yourself in a low place before. And he finds himself in a low place without a purpose. Because though he's going through the motions of life, he's not accomplishing anything. And though he's going through the motions, he has got a mediocre life at best. He's going to show up tomorrow and throw weed up in the air, but nothing's going to really happen because there's no wind to blow the air or the wheat out of the way. 
And so he finds himself in the bottom of this wine press. But I think another reason is that he's afraid. It tells us he's hiding the wheat. But I believe that Gideon was doing more than hiding the wheat. I think he was hiding himself. So he had fears in his life. The enemy is attacking him. The enemy is up ground, above ground. And so Gideon thinks, I should go below ground. I'll hide. He really is just cowering, hiding, afraid, hiding out from everybody. Maybe some of you find yourself there. Some of you may even still be hiding out in 2016. You're not ready for the new year. Maybe you're hiding in your successes. You had a good year, but you don't want to bring in a new year. You just want to stay and revel in the stuff that was done. Or maybe you had an awful year, and you're just hiding in it. You're hiding in the pain. You're hiding in the discouragement. You're hiding in the doubt that you have. You're just there. You're just hiding away. You're not accomplishing anything really by hiding. Gideon wasn't accomplishing anything. He was throwing stuff up in the air. It wasn't doing any good. But what he was accomplishing is he felt safe. And all that you can take into 2017 with you may be safety. You just feel safe. I'm not going to go on any risk anymore. I'm not going to risk in relationships. I'm not going to risk in my trust. I'm not going to risk in growing in my faith. I'm not going to have any risk. I'm just going to hide away. And see, what I've got to here to tell you is the enemy may be coming for you, but you can be brave. The enemy may be, have come for you in 2016. It may be sickness that hit you. It may be financial discourse that hit you. It may be all the relationship garbage that hit you. It may just be all the junk that you pile on and drag through life with you that came in 2016. But you can be determined. In 2017, you, can, you don't have to hide back in your failings. You don't have to hide back in your successes. You can move forward to 2017 and go, there's something new. God wants me to be brave. Shout brave. A little bit better shout, determined. There we go. Brave. Brave. Determined. Brave. I didn't even ask you to shout that time when you did it. That was good. You're with me. Be lion hearted. And then in verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Gideon. So he, he's in this wine cellar. He's down there going through the motions of life. He's not happy, he's not fulfilled. Just going through the motions. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Did we miss something? Was there a verse that we didn't get to read? Like, what was going on here? Mighty hero? I mean, we just found Gideon hiding in a wine cellar, doing something that had no purpose whatsoever, going through the motions of life, going through his fearful, cowering, I mean, mighty hero? How many of you know that God speaks life into us even when we are surrounded by death? Even when we believe the worst about ourselves, even when we're in shame, he speaks life into us. How many of you know that God shows up on to your scene and tells you there's a different chapter to your life? He says, this isn't the end of it. I didn't put the end. It's just a new chapter. It's a new place. He says, you may think this is who you are, but it's not who you are. Here's a truth that you need to write down. Here's a truth that you need to own. You need to walk into 2017 with is, is what is true about you now does not not have to be true about you later. I'm going to go to this side because this side is not preaching with me. I'm going to tell you, what is true about you now does not have to be true about you later. There we go. It's true. Just because you're cowering in the wine cellar, just because 2016 beats you up a little bit, just because your marriage seems to be falling apart, just because you keep looking at the bank account and you keep spending too much and you keep not making enough, it doesn't mean that's who you've got to be tomorrow. He says, Gideon, you're a mighty hero. God speaks life over him. He tells him, this is who I believe you can be. You see, this is what's true about 2017. Look at, look at the statement from God. It does not fit the context of his circumstances. 
Because I know for many of you, when you hear statements like that, the first thing you do is you go to the Rolodex in your mind of all of your circumstances. You start playing the reel of the movie that's going on in your mind. You, you kind of pause it. You look at it and go, this, my circumstances don't add up to what you're saying. My circumstances don't add up to what the Bible is saying. This is not true either about Gideon's circumstances. His circumstances were not that he was a mighty hero. His circumstances, what was going on right then, was much different. He was cowering. He was afraid. He was hiding. He was accomplishing nothing. He wasn't living on purpose. But God has a way of speaking into our potential. Potential. See, potential is something that every single one of you have right now for 2017. You know that what we all share is, is that all we have for 2017 is potential. Every single one of us. You may have failed in 2016. You may have succeeded in 2016. In fact, you may be sitting next to someone right now who had the hardest time of their life this last year. Or you may be sitting beside someone who had a great 2016 and they are celebrating all that happened in 2016. But no matter who you are, the only thing that any of us have right now is potential. Potential. And God speaks into our potential. He speaks into our potential with purpose. He gives us purpose. And when we combine our potential with God's purpose, there is power that comes alive in us and we begin to see God move in incredible ways. He has something that he wants to do for you. Potential. God speaks into his potential. And my hope is that I will be able to speak into potential in you for this year. I hope as a church we see the potential that God has for us. We talked about it earlier. We had 1,860-something people here for Christmas Eve. That amazes me. It's incredible. I believe that God has clearly spoken to this church, to the leadership of this church, that is a double portion year in 2017. In fact, I believe that we, don't, we won't even know what to do at Easter. Like we, we, we will be asking you guys to do unusual things at Easter, coming at usual times, because God is using you to reach people. There's potential. In fact, there's potential right now. I want you to think right now about one person that's far from God, but they're close to you. Think of that one person that you love so much, but they're far from God. Their life is falling apart. You know who they are. You've captured them in your mind. There's potential that they'll be sitting in the seat right next to you in the next few weeks. There's potential. 2017 has a new story that it wants to write for them. Potential. But potential is only as good as the action that is taken behind the potential. One of the most, one of the failings that I had in my life, one of the things I look back on with the most regret, if there's anything I look back on with regret, it is the fact that when I was in sixth grade, they asked me, the coaches did to come try out for the JV team basketball team. Saw me in the gym classes. I had a good shot. I had some good, you know, skills that were there. And they said, hey, would you come try out? I was young to be trying out, but they said, come try out. We want to see you in action. And so in my sixth grade year, I went and tried out. And I went and I did everything I could do. All I did in that time is play basketball. I played basketball every day. I practiced every day. I did everything I could do to become a better basketball player. I studied people. I was going to be a basketball player. I went to the tryout. And you guys probably don't remember this or maybe you do if you're my age. But back then, you used to try out and then they put this sheet on the door. I don't know if they still do that now. They probably have to give everybody a participation trophy at the end of tryouts. But back then, they used to put a sheet on the door and it was the sheet of shame. If you didn't make it on to that sheet, because everybody would come and huddle around. Coach would tape it up on there, and then you would come, and everybody would huddle around. There were some people who knew their name was going to be on it. They didn't even come look. They were that confident. I wasn't one of them. I had to come and look. And after the first tryout, I remember going through the names, going through the names, going through the names. Going through, oh, found myself. Sean Wood, come back the next time. Come up back the next day. I made it. The first cut. So I went back the next day, and we had to run suicides, and I ran suicides. And, I mean, I was trying and giving to everything. I even scored a couple points in the little scrimmage game, the little sixth grader. And I was little, man. I was little in sixth grade. And I scored all the points. I scored a couple of points. I was doing great. I felt good. I felt good. And I remember the next day they put that list up on the board. And I walked up there with a little bit more confidence. I didn't have enough confidence not to go look at it, but just a little bit more confidence and I scanned the paper, scanned the paper, scanned the paper, scanned the paper. No Sean Wood. And I dropped my head. And I remember, I, 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 I could feel that moment because I walked away. And I knew just down the hallway here where I was at, the coach was down there. And I was trying just not to look at him. 
And he grabbed me and pulled me to the side. He said, hey, you've got a ton of potential. Come back next year. You've got a ton of potential. Come back next year. And I have to tell you, I went home and I got an attitude and I got angry and I got bitter. And I was like, forget them. Forget them. They don't want me on the team. Forget them. They're lost. Seventh grade came, I didn't try out. Eighth grade came, I didn't try out. In eighth grade, I even would tell people still, but I got potential. The coach said I got potential. I'll probably go out next year. I don't know. Coach said I got potential. About ninth grade, potential still there. Can I tell you, I sat on the pot of potential through ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade. How many of you know if you sit on the pot too long, all you get is ring around the hiney. That's all you get. And I sat on that pot of potential so long to where there was no potential left. And all it was was talking about potential. And I never tried again. Because if you don't activate your potential, it is lost potential. And some of you have some great potential. Some of you have something that God wants to speak on you. And he's spoken it to you for several years in a row. He said, I want you to be a leader. I want you to grow in your faith. I want you to grow in this area of your life. And he's told you there's potential. He's mighty warrior, mighty hero he's speaking over you. And you're saying, yeah, I got potential. I got potential. But you got to get up off the pot of potential and have some action. And what is true about you now doesn't have to be true about you later if you will activate your potential. Potential. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Gideon gets a little bitter, starts to complain just a little bit. He's complaining about it being hard. He's complaining about unmet expectations. He says, didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. He's just complaining. The Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us, he says. God says there's potential in you and Gideon just complains about his circumstances. God says, there's a purpose that I have for you. Gideon just continues to live a purposeless life, throwing the grain up and complaining to God. I find it interesting that Gideon is complaining about God not being there, saying that he has abandoned him when God is right there, speaking to him. Do you see the irony in this? God is saying, I'm with you, Gideon. I'm here speaking to you, Gideon. He's saying, I, I just feel abandoned, God. I feel like you're not here for me, God. And God's going, hey, maybe sometimes we feel abandoned when you've just been absent. Maybe the presence of God has always been there, but you've just stepped away from it. Maybe you were living in the fumes of your potential when God wanted you to activate your potential. And you're not abandoned, but absent. I wonder how many of us in 2016 truly experienced the presence of God. Tr truly found every opportunity to just get into his presence. Say, God, you're here. You're with me. What, what, what can I do, God? Where can I go? If you're with me, I can go anywhere. I can do anything. And then the Lord turned to him. And I love the fact that often in the Old Testament when God is having these conversations with the men and women that we learn from, from the Old Testament, that they will say things to God. We see this several times in the Old Testament. They will say stuff to God. Maybe they'll complain. Maybe they'll talk about their circumstances. Maybe they'll talk about how they can't do it or that they're just not good enough, all these things. And God just kind of brushes that off and goes right on with what he wants to say. We would call it ignoring, except ignoring is rude and God's not rude. But it's the God way of ignoring. Okay, so this is what he does. And he says, then the Lord Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. He says, you go. You, you activate your potential. God interrupts Gideon's complaining and interjects a command. A command is something that he gives us for action. So he's saying, activate your potential. I told you you, were, you had potential, mighty hero. Now go be one. I told you you could be the spouse that I want you to be. Now go be it. I spoke to you and gave you that dream for your life. Now go live it out. I spoke to you and told you that I want you to be a leader of people. I want you to disciple people. I want you to bring your friends your heathen friends, 
All my friends are heathens, take it slow. Anybody know that one? Come on. But I want you to bring them. I want you to bring them. And he said, God, I can't be the one. I can't be the one. God, I can't do this. He says, well, I was speaking potential. Now go do it. Be the leader. Get your house in financial order. Do the things you need to do. Be the spouse. Be the parent. Be the friend. Be the employee. You be what I've called you to be. Because when you'll be what I've called you to be, here's what God's told me. You can do anything through Christ who strengthens you. So he says, I want you to be strong, Gideon. You're a mighty warrior. I want you to activate your faith. Go with the strength you have. But the Lord, but Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? Gideon is like me, and he's probably like you as well. He still doesn't quite get it. God, God told him, said, I'm with you. God told him, said, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to be with you. You're a mighty warrior. You're going to do all that. You're going to crush the Midianites. Gideon, but Gideon replies, but how can I rescue Israel? And, and here's what I'm saying. You can't, Gideon. But when God is with you, you can. You can't be the spouse that he's called you to be. But when God is with you, you can. You can't be the leader he's called you to be. But when God is with you, you can. He says, it's not about you, Gideon. I'm with you. And then Gideon says, my clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least in my entire family. In other words, my family is a hot mess. And I am the weakest of all. I'm the run of the family. I'm the, I'm the one who doesn't make it, God. And my family's not even good enough to do this. Some of you can relate with that. You go, Sean, you just be a small group leader? Disciple people? Hey, come, come to my next family gathering and then ask me that again. Come, come and see my family in action. You don't know where I came from. You, you don't know what's happening, you might say. Just, you, you, you don't know what I have come out of. And Gideon's saying, you, just, you don't know, God. He's forgotten that God made him. He's forgotten that God placed him in that family. He's forgotten that God came to him when he was hiding in a wine cellar. See, God comes to us in our weakest moments to speak potential into our lives, even when we feel shame, because he believes what he says. If I'm with you, you can do anything. And so he says, that is my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you. I'm walking with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. You see, I think oftentimes we are waiting for a blessing that God will give us. When God is speaking to us on the strength that we already have. In, in other words, here's what Gideon really wanted. And it's what you and I want too. He wanted his circumstances to change. He, he wanted to wake up and come out and go, all right, everything's good now. Everything's great now. The Midianites are gone. God removed them. I came from out of the wine cellar, and everything is fine. Everything is good. He, he wanted everything around him to be like he wanted it to be. In other words, he's saying, God, make it the hard stuff. Make it the trials. Make it the journey of life. Go away. And you just provide for me, God. And God's going, no, no, no. Here's what I want to do. I want to go with you through the stuff. Because if I go with you through the stuff, then I can change you. I'm not here to change your circumstances. I'm here to change you. Because if I can change you and you'll go with me, we can accomplish anything. You'll be strong. You'll be determined. You'll be brave. You'll be lion-hearted. And the only way you'll be made lion-hearted is to go through the things that lions go through, the hard stuff. He says, I want to make you that way. See, we're waiting for what we want instead of working what we've got. And God says, I've already given you what you've got. You've got my strength. I've already given you what you need. You've got me. So all of us are trying to think, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? When God said, I've got, you got me. Get into my presence. Stop hiding. Get into my presence. Stop, stop wasting time. Find purpose. Get power to your life. Be lion-hearted. Because you got me. 
and with me we can do anything. You see, I know what some of you are thinking though. Because I've sat through these type of sermons. I've lived these out in my heart. I've wrestled with the things that are in my life. And what you're thinking is, is, but you don't know my life. But you don't know what I went through. But you, you, I, I, Sean, I just call it like I see it. I mean, you don't know where my marriage I just call it like I see it. You don't know where my marriage is. I just call it like I see it. You have no idea what's going on in my life. I just call it like I see it. Don't do that. Don't call it like you see it. How did Gideon see it? He saw the bottom of a wine cellar. He saw an afraid heart. He saw a purposeless life. He saw fear. He saw shame. And I would say, call it like God says it. What did God say? You're a mighty hero. What did God say? I'm going to do something in your life. What did God say? You're going to be brave. What did God say? You're going to be determined. I'm going to work in you and through you. And because of you, we're going to destroy your enemy. You're not even going to feel like you're fighting more than one person. But you got to walk with me. Don't call it like you see it. Call it like I say it. Your husband is not lost. He's just not saved yet. Call it like God says it. Your small group is not just you and your wife. It's just got a lot of room for growth and potential. Call it like you see, God sees it, not like you see it. Your story is not of pain, but a purpose. He's going to use you just like he used Gideon who's being preached on in 2017 in spite of his fear and in spite of the shame that he was carrying because he had a plan to use him. Here's a question I think we have to ask. What can I believe today? What can I believe today about myself? What can I believe today about what God could do through me? What can I believe today about what God says that will allow me and enable me to be able to do tomorrow what I can't do today? What do you need to believe about yourself that will allow 2017 to bring about revelations in your life that will be met that you can't do today, but if you'll believe it today, you can do it tomorrow? I think you need to hear you're a mighty hero. You're brave and you're determined. Where do you need to be brave and determined in your life? As we go through counseling with people and we get a chance to pastor this church, there's three areas that I want to give you a suggestion on and give you some tools on. The first one is this. As people come in over and over again, we hear one of the greatest needs is, I want to have a better marriage. I want to have a healthier marriage. I want my marriage to be better next year than it was this year. And I want to give you a suggestion. In fact, I would like everybody who's married to take me up on this suggestion. In February, Seacoast Church is going to be having the Unite Marriage Conference. Every time Connie and I go to a marriage conference, our marriage is made better. Sometimes it's made better because it allows us to surface things that we need to work through. Sometimes it's made better because it encourages us. God finds us where he needs to find us, in the low place sometimes, on the threshing floor sometimes, and brings purpose to our marriage. I'm begging you to go to the marriage conference this year. Don't just hear from God. Don't just have potential, but have activated potential. We'll give you more information about how to sign up for that and be a part of that. It's something that you need to do. Strengthen and grow your marriage. The other area that I often hear people talk about is I'll preach about generosity. I'll preach about tithing. I'll preach about how we want to be a generous church. And so often we will hear people say, I want to be generous. I wish I could be generous. I just can't afford to be generous can't do it. I've dug myself into this pile of debt that I can't get out of. I overspend and I've got a problem and I know it. I don't know how to manage my money to have more money at the end of the month. I always have more month than I have money. And I just don't know how to do it. And so we want you to start your year off right. We're asking everyone, say everyone, everyone, no exceptions. We're asking everybody to get into a small group. January 15th for six weeks. We're just asking for six weeks. And go through the course that we've got. I was broke, but now I'm not. Some of you might go, well, I'm not broke. I've got extra money. I am generous. Great. You would be great to facilitate a group and teach people how you got there. Some of you go, well, I don't like the term broke. Fine. You're not broke. You're just 
in debt or you're just you got potential, all right? You, got, you have financial potential. How about that? I had potential. Now I don't because I activated it in my financial life. How about that? We want to ask all of you to take it, all of you to be a part of it. We believe it's going to be life-changing for our church and for you. And then the third thing is the presence of God. What if, what if everyone here decided that this year, every day, even if just for a small amount of time, I'm going to get into the presence of God by reading His Word. I'm not going to set a goal to read 15 chapters a day. I'm not going to read through the Bible in a year. I'm just going to say I'm going to get into His presence every day, every day. And then afterwards, I'm going to ask two simple questions. God, what are you saying to me? What's the potential? What are you saying to me? And what am I going to do about it? Activate the potential. And what if you did that 365 times, just a few minutes in God's Word, writing down what He's saying to you and what, he, what you're going to do about it? How would that change your life? How would it change your life? So we're going to take on, we're going to call it writing the Word. We're going to write down what we read in a journal. We're going to say, God, what are you saying to me about it? And what are you going to do about it? I'm going to do it on Facebook. I'm going to lead us through it every single day. Write the word every day. Here's what we're reading. Here's what God's saying to us. Here's what we're going to do about it. I'm going to ask you for comments to get involved. You're going to write in a journal. We're going to read the scriptures. We're going to get into his presence because God is here. He's not absent. We are. Let's get back into the word and hear from him. What are you saying to us and what are we going to do about it? And if we did that, I believe that we would be lion-hearted. I believe that we would be brave. Shout out brave. I believe we'd be determined. Shout out determined. Because we would be lion-hearted people going after God. Anybody with me? Anybody with me? Let's do that together. God, thank you so much. In the story of Gideon, you teach us to put our fears away. Through the story of Gideon, you teach us that your presence is always palatable and near us. Through the story of Gideon, you teach us that if we will obey, you will make the hardest things in life feel so light and you will take away the burden. And so God, now we respond to you wanting to be brave, wanting to be determined, Wanting to be lion-hearted, God, we want to get our relationships in order. God, we desire to get our finances in order because it brings peace and freedom to our life. And God, we want to feel and experience your presence. God, we respond to you now through repentance at the cross, asking you to forgive us. We take communion together on the sides, just remembering the body and the blood of Jesus. We give of our tithes and offerings because it is an act of worship to be generous. And we sing and worship you. In Jesus' name.